Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Life Support. If you enjoy the content, we would ask that you like it, hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. Hey, I'm so glad you're with us on Life Support. What we do on this program is we tell stories because uh, stories can help us find a deeper relationship with Jesus. And the stories we tell, the tools that we want to offer, um, have to do with things we don't normally talk about, suffering and trauma. But, wow, they are a part of our lives, and so we need to talk about these things. And I believe that God is in these things. And my special guest today is Laura Howe from Hope Made Strong. Laura is the founder of that organization. Laura, thank you for being here. Appreciate it very much. So great to be here, yes. Tell me about Hope Made Strong. We're an organization who loves to support churches. Uh, right now, there's been a definite increase in care needs in our community and in our congregation and even amongst our staff. And so the church is a frontline support for many of these people. And so we want to equip churches to be able to care for people well without burning out themselves. So that's what we do. We do that through consulting, training, and online courses and events. That's terrific. Have you found that uh, COVID has uh, drained some of the life out of the pastors and others that you're trying to help? Yes, most definitely. I think COVID has caused so much change. Um, and, and so adapting to that change takes a toll on everyone, whether it's you're moving houses or getting married or changing jobs or a two-year pandemic. So I think the change has definitely weighed on everyone and has been like an incubator on what it has happening in people's personal lives. And so if things are going well, then you're faring pretty good. But if things have been a struggle or there's some cracks in the foundation or maybe struggling with your mental health, then it's been like an incubator and it's just magnified those issues so much more for many, many people. Yeah, I think for pastors, it's been difficult because everything you thought you knew and all this wisdom that you gathered over all these years are out the window. And, and even it's funny because, you know, we all read these same kind of church gurus about all these different um, and they don't know either. Um, everybody's sort of flailing away right now trying to figure it out. But it's okay to admit you don't know, right? You don't have to pretend. Yes. There's strength in that vulnerability, right? If, if people think I know it all and I'm strong and I've got this, well, that's intimidating. I think there's, I think there's strength and some relatability of saying, this is new and I'm just kind of winging it. Do you want to come along for the ride? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so, we're, we've talked about caregivers last time and, and, and what it's like to be one and some, some ways to take care of yourself. But there's also a whole other dynamic if you are involved with a church and how the church reaches in and takes care of a caregiver. Um, one of the things that I found through some of the things that have happened in my life are that people want to help, but they don't really know what to do, and so they can cause more hurt than they do um, help. Mm -hmm. How can a, a friend that kind of looks across the room and sees this person who is, is taking care of someone or, or the pastor looks tired or whatever the case may be, what are some ways to lean in to that person's life without being overbearing or without trying to direct them to where you think they should go. I first want to acknowledge the awkwardness of that moment of having a sense when something is not right or something is not sitting or someone is in struggle or, or suffering and, and not feeling like you have the capacity or the qualifications to be able to support. That's a really awkward and hard moment uh, to sit in that uncomfortable space. And, and when we have that stress or that anxiety or that worry, our brain doesn't always function at full capacity. And I don't know about you, but I, there are many of times where I'm like, I think back and I was like, oh, I was just reacting to a stressful moment rather than responding to a need. And, and, 
and I think there's some, you can, I think there's some help there in acknowledging that is a hard moment to sit in. And because there's, you, you have this question of, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do because in all reality, there's nothing that you can do to fix or to solve the problem, you know, especially if it's, if it's someone who's struggling with grief or, or an, or a, a problem that has developed over time or an issue and, you know, no one has a magic wand. And so what do you say when you just don't know what to say? I think that is a situation every person, whether they're a caregiver or a pastor or a neighbor or a friend has been in. And I have actually five things, five steps that you can go through or five tips of different things that you can do to say when you just don't know what to say. Um, did you want to go through those at all? Or yeah, did you want to? That would, yeah, that would be great. Okay, fantastic. Well, the first thing to do is to validate someone's experience. Uh, we don't need to hear what your aunt Sue did if they were in that similar situation. That's not thank helpful. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> No, do not tell someone else your story. Oh, when so-and-so went through that, you know, let's just sit in the moment and recognize what the person is experiencing. And it's okay to say, wow, this is really hard. This is awful. This must be so difficult for you. I think, I think when someone hears those words, they feel validated, they feel understood, they feel like there's compassion and empathy coming towards them, rather than hearing about someone else and you're distracting for what someone's experience is. So number one, if that's all you do, that is fantastic. This is the one thing you do is validate someone's experience. The second, second thing that we can do is acknowledge the person's strengths in that moment of suffering. If we can think back to a moment for ourselves, when we are just overwhelmed with grief or overwhelmed with stress or a situation has suddenly come upon us, it is really hard. Our mind is going a mile a minute. We are trying to make decisions and choices when we don't have all of the information. And it is hard. If someone is struggling through depression and they are getting out of bed that day, that is really hard work. And so I think it's important to number one, validate their experience. And number two, acknowledge the person's strengths. Wow, you are facing a really hard time. You are doing a fantastic job. Or I can see that you are working hard in this area. Or I would do, I, what you're doing is incredible. I couldn't imagine doing what you are facing, what you are facing. And I think it's a vote of confidence. It's encouragement. You're bolstering that person. You're standing beside shoulder to shoulder with them in, in communicating their strengths. Yeah. Those words are just life giving mm -hmm. when you're in that situation. Yes, absolutely. Um, the next thing is you can offer support that doesn't seem overwhelming. Uh, so often we say things like, hey, if you need me, I'm right here for me. Give me a call. And, and so you're putting the onus and the responsibility on the other person to reach out. They have a million and one things that they're handling. They don't have time and they don't want to burden anyone. That's the last thing they want to do is to cause anyone else a burden or hardship. Or have and to so, explain again exactly what's going on to hard work. Yeah, this is why I'm reaching out or, or it's admitting a weakness or a fault or a failure. And that is like overwhelmingly hard. So if you ever say, call me, if you need me, don't expect a call. People don't call. And so what you can do is offer something small and manageable that's within your capacity. So maybe it's, can I call you tomorrow and check in? Can I drop off a coffee tomorrow morning? Hey, I'm going to the grocery store. Do you want me to pick you up a few things? You know, you are actually offering, but if that person says, no, thanks, I'm fine. We need to honor and respect that. But I think by suggesting something that you have the capacity to do is not putting the burden on the person who is struggling. That's really good. I had a lady uh, tell me on this program who had gone through some really severe things. Uh, she had a, a dear woman who simply sent her a card every week without fail in the mail, in the real mail, snail mail. Real mail. Mm -hmm. And that's the lady just offered. And it meant so much to her because there was no expectation at all. It was just, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm here. And uh, that's what they really want is presence, not right. um, advice or yeah. those kinds of things.
Yeah. So far we've gone through the first three and there is no advice giving. There is nothing. It is just encouragement and support. And it's interesting that the next one is being silent. You know, that is the, 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 the power of presence is absolutely transformational. Just being there with someone, the person knows nothing you can say or do is going to change the situation and their mind is going at a mile a minute. It's foggy. It's cloudy. They got a lot on their mind. And so by someone just talking and talking and talking because they are uncomfortable, that is not helpful. So staying silent and just being present can be so, so soothing and so helpful. Mm-hmm. And then the first, then the fifth and final one is offering encouragement. Um, encouragement, and, and again, it's kind of bookending the this this um, support um, moment and support where you're offering encouragement and thanking them for what they're doing and that they're doing a good job. Because whenever there's a, a suffering or um, hardship, it feels like a failure. It feels like you haven't done enough. You haven't worked hard enough. You haven't solved the problem. And it can feel like a personal failure or a failure in a, in a, in, in navigating the system or, or it doesn't matter. It just feels like a failure and, and a mark on you. And I think it's important that people know that we believe in them and that nobody else sees this as a personal failure. And so just encouraging people with things like you're very kind and giving the community is lucky to have you. I am so glad you are my friend, Um, you know, providing that encouragement about who they are, not what they've gone through is about who they are, can be really life giving as well. Uh, That's really good. Uh, Laura Howe is my guest from Hope Made Strong, talking a little bit about how to relate to those who are caregivers in whatever situation uh, they might be in. Um, Part of the problem with these things that you've laid out, they're all right but you put your finger on it when you said feeling uncomfortable is not really acceptable. Um, I pastored in Canada for quite a long time. You're in Canada. I love Canadians because they're they're very stoic, but then when they want to, um, they can really like um, have an edge or they can just be super, super great. But you have to kind of prompt them a little bit because they're <laughs> at least out there on the West Coast, they're a little bit British and a little stoic, you know, and you got to always have tea. And I never have quite figured that out. Um, But people are basically people, right? And no one likes to not have a way to fix a problem. We're conditioned to want to put a bow around everything. You know, if there's a shooting, we have to know why. We have to know why. We, We can't, we have to blame someone. So let's blame the NRA. Let's not, you know, let's blame the shooter, whoever. Um, how do you how do you overcome that fear of just feeling weird? Yeah, it's true. We like to live in black and white situations where there's a right and wrong. There's um uh you know there everything fits in a nice compartment. There's reason. There's justice. There's you know and 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 when you are a caregiver, maybe because I've done this for fifteen years, but you need to get comfortable in living in the gray, where there is no right and wrong. You know there is no you know apart from Jesus, right? Well, right. let's right. let's you know keep that right. separate from the conversation. Uh, right. So I don't want people to think that you know there's there's definitely um, gospel, yeah. but I'm thinking of the situations when someone has to make a decision between two hard decisions, and and the, you have to it's it's a it's an awkward moment, and we try to fill that void with chatter or reason or excuses or blame or shame. We try to fill that void with something so that we can compartmentalize it. Compartmentalize it. And and it's sometimes it's just you live in the gray where you have to just get comfortable with being in a situation where there is no right and wrong. It's just hard. Yeah. And you have to trust that Jesus is in the gray with you. Absolutely. Yeah. You're right. There's, you know, 
there was a, a message preached recently and that it provided me so much freedom. We talked about, you know, the will of God, like there is one way, the one will of God, but I think the will of God is being in the presence of God, wherever you are, you're seeking the presence, you're seeking to obey, to listen and obey and to have the presence of God with you. And, and there's this pressure intensity to make the right decision. And, and I think we need to just seek the presence of God. Yeah. Okay. Here's the all time worst thing to okay. say in my own uh, opinion. Um, when someone's either suffering or is a caregiver, when you say, Oh, I understand how you feel. Oh. That's a death knell. Now, I have people, you know, when you've gone through trauma, you know, other people find you that have gone through that same trauma. You know, like, so I've lost a wife, I've lost a son. These are clubs you don't want to be in, but the, pe the people find you. Even when someone l goes through a similar experience, you still don't know how they feel because every experience is different. Okay. And when you, the moment you say that, that I'll guarantee you that person is going to click you off. You're you're out. You know, no you don't. There's going to be a defensiveness and you're going to lose your opportunity to minister to that person. But that's the first thing sometimes we want to say because we want to immediately establish connection, right? And we yes. we how can we establish connection without saying something like that? That connection people are trying to build always starts with I. I understand. I know someone who's been through I, when the sentence starts with I, then you are distracting from the person's need. So I encourage people to say the phrase, the very first phrase, it sounds like you're going through a lot. Mm. It sounds like if you, if, and it, and it provides them opportunity to rephrase or to, to make that connection. So I often say, it sounds like you're and then fill in the blank, uh, rather than starting the sentence with I. So, oh my goodness, it sounds like you're going through a lot. That must be really difficult. That is such a different way. It, it builds a bridge. It says you are present. It says you are here, but it doesn't distract from what the person is experiencing. And it also gives them a chance then to explain, um, you know, to lay it out how they want to lay it out because they may not want to tell you a lot and they may just say, yeah, we are going through a lot. Absolutely. Done. That's an invitation. Yeah, that's right. And and I think sometimes the other risk we run is if someone does close up and doesn't want to talk about it, uh, we feel like, well, if you don't want my help or, you know, um, and, and all of a sudden, I mean, here's the sin problem, right? It, we want it to be all about us, even though it's really all about that person. But even when we're ministering to a person, we still want it to be all about us. Because we're dealing with sin, we're dealing with a wicked heart, we're dealing with all these human emotions. And so one thing I want to say is if you, if you have said some of these things we're talking about, you're, you're not condemned, you know, I mean, uh, just learn from it. When these things started happening to me, I remembered back at some of the things I've said to others, and I just cringed. Like, I can't believe I said that. And then I had to let it go because I didn't know any better. So please don't think of this as condemning or, you know, you, you've done irreparable harm. These are just tools that we're trying to give you to help you move into someone's life. In your experience, um, are there a lot more people going through things in our churches than we think there are? Than we think there are? Yeah. Yes. Than there were before? Maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think life is a struggle. Life is hard, you yep. know, and what people are experiencing in their extended family or at their workplace or, or, or in their home. Um, we often bring our, our best out when we're going to church or we're going to events. That's where we, you know, we, we shine up, we put our best clothes on. We, we no one wants to be the downer at the party. No one wants to talk about the hardship and the struggle. Um, and so there's this assumption that that is what their life is all the time, but I can tell you it's not, it's not, you know, there's a resource called mental health Sunday and, and it helps pastors talk about mental health from the stage on a Sunday morning. 
And I, the feedback that I received from that is, oh, my people don't struggle with that. And I was like, then you have no idea because people are struggling with this and lots of other things all the time. And it's just what they're presenting with because they want to make friends. They want to be friendly. They want to have a good time. They're, they're looking for an outlet and, but uh, providing the support so that people can connect maybe privately or at a different time is, it can be really helpful. I think one of the greatest gifts that I can give to my congregation, and I don't always know how to do this, but to give them myself, to give them enough where they know that I'm struggling with the same stuff they're struggling with, that I don't have it all together, that um, I struggle with mental illness too. And the moment you start saying those things, then they're suddenly freed up to say, yeah, me too. Like, if, you know, if pastor can say that, I love that. They always call me pastor. I always say, oh, it's Paul. No, it's pastor. All right. But, you know, if pastor can say that, then I can think that too. And it's not unchristian to admit life is hard for me. Yeah. It's, it's the vulnerability. It's being honest. It's, it's being relatable, right? That's what we said yeah. at the beginning is being relatable. Um, but people often don't know, okay, what is too far? Like, what can I share that is helpful oh. where you're not distracting or you're turning the tables where now I'm hoping other people will care for me. Like how as a leader, can we share the vulnerabilities of life without oversharing? And I encourage people to talk about um, sharing from their scars, not from their wounds. And I did not make that up. So I cannot take that credit, but I heard it from someone somewhere. And it's really good. We talk about our scars, those, the things that have, if you poke your scar, it doesn't hurt, right? We've healed from it. We've learned a lesson from that. But if you poke a wound that's open, that's still mm. current, that's sore, it hurts. So as a leader, when you're talking about your vulnerabilities and you're creating, creating those relatable moments, then talk about your scars rather than your wounds. And then, you know, you're in a healthy space um, in leading people. That's really, really good. Say that one more time, because wanna, I think we all need to hear that. Yeah. We want to share from our scars and not share from our current wounds, because we want to be able to relate and share vulnerability with people without um, wanting, without expecting any um, reciprocation of care. Because if you're still in that wound, you're gonna you're going to be a victim. You're gonna sound like a victim at least, yeah. and you're gonna to want to elicit some kind of a feedback. Yeah. But if you have healed from it, at least you know to whatever extent that you can from some of these things, then it will be a, an encouraging help to someone who mm -hmm. can say, "Yeah, okay, I can get through that too." And, and it's okay to say, you know, I, you know, hey, this you know this loss never goes away. That's truth. But you can also say, but, you know, it's changed and God has done amazing things through this. But does it hurt sometimes? Sure, it does. And it's OK to share feelings. But I really like what you just said, because that helps me as a pastor know what the boundaries are. Right. Because I, it's really hard to, when you're when you're going through preparing for a sermon or something and there's an illustration that fits you perfectly and you could really give some of yourself to that. It's hard to know. Well, is that selfishness? Is that just about me? Should I, should I say that? Shouldn't I say that? Um, so those, that's a really good, uh, a really good guardrail. All right. Tell me about Hope Made Strong. Hope Made Strong is an organization where we come alongside churches and support them as they care for their people, but without burning out. So often in ministry, you know, there's a calling, there's a commitment, there's a dedication to serve others. And, and that is fantastic. And I want to support you in doing that with tips like these things and trainings and tools. Uh, but we also need to care for the caregiver. So come alongside of you uh, with courses and, and, and cohorts uh, to provide support for you, the ministry leader. We also have an event called Mental Health Sunday as well as Church Mental Health Summit, where we provide tools, resources, strategies, and um, encouragement around mental health and faith. Good for you. How do I get a hold of you? Go to hopemainstrong.org, uh, where everything will be listed, uh, the menu. I'm not a techie person, so go to the website. It will be under resources, uh, and you'll be able to find everything through, through there. All right. Wonderful. Laura, thank you so much for spending time with us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me.